Stay more comfortable, more concealed, and in the stand longer with Osseo gear. Premium camouflage apparel created for bow hunters by bow hunters. Osseo's revolutionary patented camo patterns and innovative features are designed to keep whitetail bow hunters totally invisible and dead quiet. Elevate your game with Osseo. Visit asiogear.com and take 20% off your purchase with code TRUTH20. Mobile hunters, our buddies over at Tethered are always innovating to keep us more mobile and in the game when it counts. From the Tethered One Sticks, the Fast Pack, to the Ultra Lock Saddle, Tethered is always designing to increase comfort and utility while reducing bulk, weight, and fiddle factor of mobile hunting gear. And now, they've outdone themselves yet again by creating the Carbon Fiber Forged Predator CFX Platform, the lightest fully featured mobile saddle platform that raises the bar for what's possible in mobile hunting gear. Whether you're new to saddle hunting or an old tree climbing veteran, go to tetherednation.com for all your saddle hunting gear. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. And today I got on a fella that I've been following for a little... I was trying to think about it before we jumped on here, man, like how I learned of you first or how I, when I started following you. And I feel like it was like a year or two ago. And I'll ask you about if, if you know the person or not, but I got on my good buddy, Mr. Cody Osborne. What's going on, dude? I'm um, doing good. Excited good, to be man. here. Nice, man. I appreciate you coming on, buddy. It's... uh. I was trying to think back whenever I, we were getting ready to jump on here. I was like, when did I first, cause you and I started talking right after I had Bobby Worthington on, like mm-hmm. that was when you and I kind of started messaging each other and stuff like that. Um, and, but the funny thing was, was like, I was following you prior to that. And I was trying to remember how I had started following you initially, but like, are you friends with, with Cody Quisto at all? Or am I making this up? I, I'm, I mean, I'm friends with him. I've, I've met him quite a few times. I mean, he, he, okay. you know, who knows who I am? I don't, I don't think right. we follow, uh, he don't follow me on social media or anything like that. But, uh, if right. we was in public, we would know each other. I mean, obviously I know him, but he would know who I am. I mean, right. We right. spoke quite a few times. Yeah. And like, I think the other part was, was like uh, there you're into fitness. And I think that was the circle mm-hmm. that I kind of like ran into you just like in the, in, on the interwebs where I was like, Oh, this dude's into fitness. He's into hunting. Like, okay, cool. Like, it seems like, seems like we're birds of a feather. Maybe I should, see what this guy's up to <laughs> <laughs> nice so uh how are where so where are you at man like where do you where do you live is it Tennessee? i'm in north alabama north, north alabama? alabama okay i'm, I'm nice. about 30 minutes i'm about well depends on which part of the state line but i'm i'm anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes from uh tennessee state line okay all right that's because for some reason i thought you were in, in tennessee what uh did you guys make it through like the storms and everything unscathed man because i know a bunch of my buddies and like the Tennessee area. And I know it's probably more like the West part of North Carolina and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Or just like had a, had a bad deal. Yeah, it was, it was good here. I mean, just like a bunch of rain up for probably four inches, something like that. But yeah, it's all, um, East of us pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, man. Cause I know, um, uh, a couple of buddies of mine live in that like Asheville area and it's just oh, yeah. not, yeah, not good, man. I, I didn't, I didn't even realize it. I was kind of oblivious to it. Cause I lived in Florida for, like 10 years. I'm used to the hurricane. So I'm kind of numb to the hurricane stuff, you know, where it's, you know, you hear about them like, all right, yeah, here. Like I remember with the one year I lived there, there was like three in a row and it was like back to back to back, like within like a four or five week period of time. So it was like every, after the first one, I took my, <laughs> I took my uh, plywood off my windows. And then the second one was coming and I put the plywood back up and I saw the forecast. I just left the plywood up for like two months. I was like, I'm not even taking <laughs> it down. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, this is a pain in the ass. I just left it all up. And so yeah. I kind of got numb to it, um, you know, so whenever I see it coming out, I mean, I, I still got friends there and stuff like that. So I'll text my friends in Florida and say, hey, you guys doing okay mm-hmm. or whatever. And they're always like, yeah, man, we went and got some beers and we're hurricane partying. That's what that's what you do yeah. in Florida, you have a hurricane party. Yeah. You know? And so when this one rolled through, you know, I saw like Florida got hit pretty good, you know, and I kind of expected it because it was, a, it was kind of a ripper of a storm and I texted my buddies and like everything, was, every, everyone was good. And, but I didn't think about it coming up like the coast like or up through like, you know, inland, you know, essentially it's like, cause you don't really think about it that much, you know, it being that devastating inland, man. But it just, I think the worst of it's probably inland than it was along the coast. Yeah, I agree. It was, it was, you, you can almost, I seen a, a map last night of the outage and it's like a clear path from, looks like from around Panama city up through Asheville It's just solid black where everything else was still got power and they were just a black stripe. It, it's yeah. 
it's pretty wild. Yeah, I mean, I think the crazy thing is, is that, you know, when you are in those, and I promise people listening, we're gonna, we're not going to be meteorologists the entire se- episode. We'll, we'll talk some deer hunting and stuff. Yeah. But uh, it's, um, you know, like Florida, for example, you know, because they deal with that, they, you know, you can argue, people who live there would argue differently probably, but they've got some infrastructure and things in place that like, this is normal for them. They get hit by hurricanes. They're kind of, I don't want to say built for it, but they're built for it to a degree. Right. Right. And, um, you know, that much water though, it's like, you know, it's hard to shed that much water, like on the roads and like, like the drainage stuff like that, it become inundated and you have problems and stuff like that, but they've got some stuff in place. But when you get outside of that and you get inland where they don't expect to take on that kind of water and you've got levees being breached and stuff like that, because you just don't think that something like that's going to come that far inland. That's whenever it gets real bad because, you might look at it and be like, yeah, the rain wasn't that bad. But when you start getting like the flash flooding and like systems becoming completely overwhelmed because they're just not built for that specifically, that's whenever the shit kind of hits the fan. I think that's kind of what happened. Yeah, exactly. You know, but yeah, thoughts out to those folks, man. Hopefully our brothers and sisters in that part of the part of the country are, are, are digging their way out and they'll be, you know, be okay. But, uh, yeah, sure. so you're from, you're from Alabama. Hi. So you, uh, how how you feel about that Georgia Bulldog Alabama game? So so my wife's an Alabama fan. I'm actually an Auburn fan, but okay. Auburn had, they just suck. So uh, <laughs> I was I was actually pulling for Georgia. I was hoping they would go. I mean, and they probably they may still do it, but I I think um, more than likely they'll be. Well, I don't know. After that game, it's kind of a toss in the air. But I was thinking there would be national championships again this year. Uh, so we'll see. But yeah, I, I was pulling. I was pulling for for. Georgia. Yeah, I was too. Just, you know, I don't have an allegiance one way or the other. My, bro- my uh, stepbrother actually walked on at Alabama. So I sometimes pull, pull for them. He played D2 ball. And then I think it was like his junior year. He started for two years at D2. And uh, I think he was a linebacker in D2. And uh, he always wanted to play at a D1. And he loved Alabama. And so he was like, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and change schools and do my last two years at Alabama. Cause I want to go to Alabama. He's like, and I'm just going to walk on and see if I can make the team, you know? And so he walked on and at last, I forget how many days he was there. It was only like some spring practices because he said he got, you know, he was like two fifteen probably he's like six, two or something like that. When he got to Alabama, he was too small to play linebacker, but technically he was too slow to play safety. You know what I mean? It was right. one of those things where he was a quintessential D two player. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And, uh, he uh, lined up in a drill, and um, I forget the running back's name. It would be people that we would he- have heard of. But it, he, the first guy was um, this big dude, and he's like, and I run up on him, and, dude, he was like, I never had seen a guy that was like 230 pounds have that kind of like shiftiness and be that quick. He's like, dude, I walked up, ran up like I was going to light this guy up. He was like, and he just gave me a little slip and was gone. You know what I mean? He was like, he's like, and so the next rep I'm up against this like 180 pound freshman. He's like, I got the guy by like 35 pounds. He's like, and I'm just expecting him to try to juke me. You know what I mean? Cause he's going to be quick. You know, he's like, I run up on him and break down. He's like, dude, he's like, I never been hit so hard in my life. He's like, the guy was like probably one of the smallest guys on the team. He was like, and just buried me. You know, he was like, that was the moment when I realized, yeah, this ain't going to work. It's a whole different level. <laughs> That's it, man. It's, it's funny about how, you know, when you get around dudes at different levels, no matter what it is, because I had that experience in music where I went and played with a really popular band. Like after my band, I had left and like another band brought me into like as a hired gun and they're still touring. They've sold a couple million records. And it's like, I walked in that room and played with them and it was like, oh shit, there's levels like to this, you know? Right. And I feel like it's, it's similar. Like when you meet some of these guys, like a Bobby Worthington or or whomever, and you start to really kind of talk to them about, their approach or their experiences and stuff like that, you realize real quick, like, even if you are a good deer hunter, you know, there's, there's levels to that game, you know, and you're just like, and they think about stuff in a different way. And they're always curious about what you think. When I think a lot of people, as they're trying to figure stuff out they're they really want to tell you what they know versus just listening to what someone else knows. Do you kind of get the same sense? Absolutely. And I mean, every time I've known Bobby for, probably six or seven years. And every time I'm around him, I'm like, I literally know nothing about Watt. <laughs> and just question everything I know. And I'm like, man, 
and like you said, you I'm trying to absorb information from him, but it's almost like you said, all the <clears throat> these elite guys, they they want they're curious, they're more curious about what you know than what they're trying to teach or something like that. They're just trying to gain little tidbits off of everybody they're around. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Cause when Bobby and I got done with that, that episode, we stayed on the phone for a little while and just kind of talked, um, about stuff and about particular deer, you know, one that I had killed one that I, why one that I had hunted and stuff like that. We just kind of chopping it up. And, um, I remember he just asked, I forget what the questions were that he asked me, but they were just so specific that he asked me that I would have never in a million years thought about, like to think of it the way he was thinking about it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And I mean, I think that's the, uh, and he's, he's an old soul too, man. Like those, mm-hmm. those guys, like we got to preserve their approach and what they know. And I think even more so than anything, how they treat people, because that's the one thing that I really appreciate about him is just how he treats people. Yeah, I agree. He, um, he, he is a, is a great human being all around. I mean, there's nothing you can say bad about him really. I mean, I've spent a lot of time with him. And every time you, you leave somebody like that, it's like, you know, guys like this are not around and they're not going to be around much longer. So you try to absorb as much information as you can. And, and that's why he's starting to put a lot of his information back out there because he, he knows he's getting to an age where he, he if he don't pass it on, it's just going to be, you know, information that goes to the waste. Yeah. 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 Cause there's really just a handful of those guys around still, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like it's the, it's him, it's the Roger Rothars, you know, the, the, the Wenzels, Wenzels, the Wenzels, mm-hmm. you know, um, I wouldn't put the Drury's in the same, I mean, great hunters, but like not the same era, right? Like right. they <laughs> saw Bobby and the Wenzels, like, and they saw them as legends, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And, and right. um, you know, and so those guys, you know, it's like our grandfathers, you know, it's like, you know, I tried to impress upon my daughter, you know, even like her great grandfather, just one of her great grandfathers just passed away over the summer. He was in his early nineties and, you know, she's, she's a good kid. And so she actually spent time with him and would ask him questions about his life and his history and stuff like that. Because, you know, those folks are just, they want someone to ask them. They want to right. pass it on. You know what I mean? Right. They want to share knowledge with you that you aren't going to get to experience firsthand, you know? Um, right. And so right after I talked to Bobby, I actually went and bought his book like right away, like pre-ordered his book, you know, because I mean, yep. he's, like he's like a, he's a gold mine of information. For sure. He really yeah. is. I, I have the the first two that he's got and then um, I have pre-ordered this one. So yeah, I, I tried to old. find the old one, man, but they were like, I couldn't find it. And then when I did, it was like, whoo, it was it was salty. <laughs> yeah, they're they're high dollar. Yeah. I was like, man, I was like, I don't know if my wife's gonna be OK with me buying a high dollar hunting book. You know what I mean? like, <laughs> a book. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. She's like, okay, so this is the guy you had on the podcast. You could ask any question and then you still had to buy the book. Like, <laughs> you know, it feels like a, a missed opportunity there, but uh, how'd you, uh, how'd you meet him? How'd you guys become friends? Um, it was, it was just a random, I can't remember what happened. I think he did a podcast on a, on a, what he considered an unkillable bug. Mm. And, um, I had his number somehow and I just called him up. And we just got to talking and I ended up meeting him probably about two weeks later. And I, I ended up getting the uh, passionate quest book from him at that point. And, um, he just, I mean, I, I literally called him up and, um, uh, like I said, I'd, I'd had his phone number from some, somebody had given it to me and told me to call him, but I just hadn't gotten around to it. it I mean, it's like a, I'd had it for probably a year and I didn't want to, it's kind of one of those things I didn't want to bother, bother mm-hmm. him. And when he brought that podcast out about the unkillable buck, I was chasing one in Illinois at that time. And I, I just, I called him and I was like, I, I got to pick your brain on this. Cause I'm, I'm chasing a deer right now that I need help. And, um, I ended up meeting him probably two weeks later and, and getting the passionate quest book. And, and we, we've stayed in touch. We probably talk weekly, hmm. maybe, maybe twice a week, you know, to this day. Right. But I spent a lot of time with him. He's also, I, he's also kind of my archery coach. I actually picked up um, a recurve this past summer. So he's been coaching me with that stuff. Nice. Yeah. He's, he's very, I mean, he's, he's humble about how good he is at shooting a bow. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's, I never knew he shot a traditional, like, I mean, I had assumed, I mean, I'd seen some pictures early in his life. So I had assumed he had because of the age in which he started hunting and stuff like that. Right. And then I saw some pictures, but I was talking to Joe miles about it the one day, Uh Um, cause I started shooting a, a long bow actually it's sitting back there on the thing. Um, 
and uh, Joe, I know, started shooting a recurve, you know, mm-hmm. this year, and then he kind of went away from it. I kind of gave him crap about it. And I was like, "Come on, dude!" I was like, "You're just gonna like." I was like, "You're a, you're more uh, you're, you're more diligent than that, like to just put it down because it's getting hard." You know what I mean? It's like you, that's not in your DNA. And uh, he said he was talking to Bobby about it, and he said, "Ask him about some pointers or whatever." And I, I don't remember how he said it. Joe asked him like, "How many?" how, how many deer maybe he killed with his longbow or, or whatever the case was, or, you know, Bobby made the comment. It was like, Oh, I'd never hunt a deer with a longbow. He's like, I'm not good enough. And he's like, and Joe, and yeah. Joe was like, well, if he's not good enough, like, what am I doing with this thing? <laughs> so Bobby, so Bobby missed what he thinks is a typical world record in Iowa with a, with a recurve. And then he missed a non-typical that he thinks is probably 240. Oof. And he said, I would give up every deer I have on my wall for those two deer and both of them was with a recurve. And he said, that's, that's the reason I don't care. Right. That's a good reason. You know, like, I mean, if it happened to me, I think I would feel the same way, you know, it's uh, yeah, I don't know, man, the pain of missing a, a deer. I've only ever had it happen one time where it was like a deer that I really wanted to kill. You know, um, I was on a trip in Iowa and, I saw just like, I, it, it wasn't even like he was like 108. It wasn't even like it was a Boone and Crockett deer. I mean, it was a good deer. Don't get me wrong. He was probably yeah. like 140 some odd inch, eight point, just super heavy, you know, super symmetrical, just beautiful. You know, it's like, like when you look at like the quintessential kind of species, or like the, you know, the, the representative mm-hmm. of the species, that's kind right. of what he looked like, you know? And I missed him. I not only did I miss him once, I missed him twice. I missed him on two different occasions. And it just like, that just freaking gutted me so i couldn't imagine like a world-class deer that you just screw the pooch on i think he said on the iowa deer he told me um back then they cut the arrows off so they Mm. would shoot just like an arrow that was made for that bow that's right past the riser now then he switched to a full length arrow but he Mm. said so that there was two trails that deer could walk by one it was at five yards and one was at 15. And he's like, at 15, it would probably been a dead deer. But the night before, a little buck had come on that five-yard trail and made a rub. And he said when that deer got to the split, he walked straight to that, that rub and was investigating it. And I don't. he said when he – it was so low, he lost the arrow in his peripheral vision um, when he was trying to shoot it. So he said – I can't remember if he shot it low or high or shot under it or over it. But he, he thinks if he'd had a full-length arrow, he probably would have killed the deer because he could right. still see the tip of the arrow in his right. peripheral vision. Right. So is there any that stick in your mind that you've, that you've missed that you wish you'd have back? It, it's not the ones that I've missed. It's more the ones that I've hit and never found, or I hit them. I actually yeah. hit one this year in Kentucky, hit him in the back strap, hmm. uh, opening, opening weekend. And, um, I, I tracked blood for probably 240 yards. And then I, which I caught, I tracked for probably 150, 160 yards. And then I caught a dog. And we looked for, you know, almost two days for that deer. And I, I had the shot and everything on video, and the deer ducks about 12 inches at the shot. So I'm hoping the deer shows back up. I'm hoping he's still alive. But it's deer like that that um, make me more sick than, you yeah. know. It, it could be because if it's a miss, I know the deer is still out there. I can still chase it. It's the chase. But hitting them and it's like i don't know if that deer's gonna go and get an infection and die and then i never get it or it goes to waste those are the ones that hurt worse than missing yeah. one to me yeah was that a early season velvet hunt it was early season it was opening weekend but he was actually shit he was actually a hard antler oh was he it? already okay. he had already shed velvet mm-hmm. nice it so was is opening, night. opening night mm-hmm. yeah that's nice dude like get a good deer was it one you knew of or was it were you just kind of hunting for opportunity down there it was. I mean, I had him on camera. He's he's probably a hundred and forty five inch nine pointer. Uh, nice. He was a. I mean, solid, nice deer. I mean, it was. Um, that's all I can ask for. Something yeah. like that. <clears throat> yeah. What was the uh, What was the setup? Were you playing just like the the food pattern that time of year? Was that what you were it, set up on? It was bed to yeah. food pretty much. I, and that's and I don't when I I've hunted Kentucky early season probably. I think this was my seventh season up there. Um, mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it's bed to food. I don't hunt mornings. I just try to catch them on their way to bed. Uh, I did a hanging hunt that afternoon and worked out perfect, but I just couldn't seal the deal on him. Right. Are you, uh, you headed back since you still have the tag? I probably will. Um, 
I've actually got two really good deer that I'm hunting in, on my Illinois farm, and then I actually have a Kansas tag. So if I do, I, I may go to Kentucky late season or, or mm-hmm. later. I, it just depends on how everything works out. Right. So we'll we'll see how that goes. But Illinois nice. is right now is my priority because it actually opened this week, and I'm on I'm gonna go this weekend. Oh, are you? <clears throat> okay, nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How about Alabama? How, so the crazy thing about Alabama. So I'd never, I've only ever been to Alabama once and I forget what part of Alabama. I was actually there for work for like a, a video shoot thing that I had to do. And, um, it was some big, like a state that we were doing this shoot on because it was like a big house and they had a bunch of different rooms that we could use for like different sets or essentially right. Different setups. And, uh, I pull up to this property and, um, first the house was beautiful and like the land was, was beautiful, you know, that it was set up on and they had a big pond and stuff like that. And I walk into the house and I'm just kind of looking around, man. And they've got a couple mounts on the wall in the living room that are just like hammer deer. Like mm-hmm. the one was probably like mid forties or was one that was like in the sixties and like another one that was, you know, clearly Boone and Crockett. And so the guy who would kind of like the groundskeeper was there and he was from the area, like, like kind of born and raised. And I asked him, I was like, are those deer from this property? Cause that estate had like a couple hundred acres, you know, mm-hmm. associated with it. And he's like, yeah, he's like the previous owners, like before this became like a, a function, like a event estate, you know, he was like the owners, like, you know, hunted, hunted here as well. He's like, so yeah, he's like, those deer are all from there. I was like, dang, you know, I was like, I didn't realize they grew those, that kind of, that caliber of deer around here. And then I have another buddy who's from Alabama who kills really good deer. And so Alabama has better deer, I think, than a lot of people think essentially they do and it's it's pretty much i would say county but kind of um general area specific i mean i'm in the northeast corner and there's a lot of great deer in this area i mean there's a there'll be 170 inch deer killed every year around here um and there and there there's different pockets along the state that have really good deer but for for the most part i would say you know 75 to 80 percent of it's just your Mature bucks are going to be 120 inches and, you know, 150, 60 pounds. Right. Um, that's, that would say that was the majority, but luckily I'm in a, I'm in a part of the state that has really good deer. Um, I'm waiting on one to show up now that is r- ridiculous how big he is, but, um, we'll see how that goes, I guess. Right. <laughs> it's always that way, isn't it? We'll just see. It's like anytime you have a, you know, of a good deer, you're always just kind of like, oh, we'll see, you know, <laughs> we'll see what he does, you know, see if I can't stick an arrow in him. But, uh, so your season already opened though, right? Like it opens in September. Yes. Sometime in September. No, I actually, um, no. So the Southern, I don't even really know the, the counties, but like pretty much the Southern half opens October 1st and, and the Northern zones open October 15th. Okay. So we're oh, still wow. a few days out for us okay. up here. Dang. So how's the, uh, how is where you hunt locally? Like, so I guess just describe to me like what type of stuff you're hunting there in, in Alabama and then like, we'll juxtapose it to against, you know, the you know, other States that you're hunting and how it's, how it might differ. So this is the foothills of the Appalachians, however you say it, Appalachians. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you pronounce it, but yeah. it's, um, it's, it's pretty steep country, um, for the most part. So, but I hunt a little bit of for mountain land and mixed ag. Um, mm-hmm. my, my wife's family has a, has a farm that I hunt around here. And other than that, I have a few, uh, knock on door permission places and, um, it's all pretty, I wouldn't say like, I don't think it's the Adirondacks or anything like up, up there, but, um, it's, it's pretty steep country for what it is. <clears throat> nice. Now, do you prefer like that steep country? Do you, is that, you know, and, and the, those better caliber of deer, do you find that they're in those kind of like steeper, harder places to get to or not, or are they still hanging around you know, the easy, the easy getting for the food? Well, I just think it depends on, um, the pressure. Yeah. Um, a lot of them, I would say like, we have a, a, a big uh, management area that's, I think it's 60,000 acres is close by. And the, the big ones that come off that place are in the steepest, roughest stuff over there. Yeah. Um, my place is, I really don't hunt around here a lot up until, because our rut comes in probably 1st of January. Okay. So I don't, I don't do a lot of hunt. I, I just, I really just sit back and just le- keep the pressure off of them. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll wait till a good one shows up and then I'll try to go in and hunt him. Nice. But, and it's fairly, it's a, 
the property that we have, it's a, it's a big north face inside of a, um, a mountain with ag at the bottom. So when it gets really cold, I, a lot of times they'll go up over the top and stay on the backside of it. But <clears throat> for the most part, they, they'll bed. It, it, we had a, a storm come through and it, it blew down a bunch of trees. So there's a bunch of tops that they bed in. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll come down to the ag. Nice. Yeah. I've always wanted to make my way to, to Alabama to hunt just because I'm like, I, I would love to do one year um, where I chase the rut in a bunch of different, like in different States that are, mm-hmm. that, that kind of slightly have slightly different ruts. Like, so essentially I hunt the Midwest during the normal time of like what we know is the rut, you know, the classic rut, I guess, if you will. And then jump to some of the States that have those odd ruts where it's like, like Alabama, I think has like five, if I'm not mistaken. Right. They do. And, and like go down, go down to Florida early because I think they rut in like July or something yeah. in Florida. You know what I mean? Right. Not that I want to hunt a swamp. I got like, I'm not into alligators and, and snakes and stuff like that, but mm-hmm. you know, um, and then maybe go visit old Joe miles, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and catch something down there. It's like, I've always kind of wanted to do that and just kind of experience the rut in different, in different places. So it's like, you can basically hunt the rut. Like when does the first rut start for you? I would say about that typical Midwest time, somewhere the second week in November, you can go West Alabama. And I mean, you're chasing deer. It's probably rutting the 10th of November. Mm-hmm. And then uh, here, I mean, you're looking at February. I mean, we go to February 10th. Right. So, um, I mean, there's, there's, you're still chasing then. Wow. That's crazy. So what's your, um, so locally, you know, for you in Alabama, what's your favorite time to hunt then? Well, it's, it's around that time frame because I'm usually, um, I'm out chasing deer in other states. We don't have, I mean, I say we have big deer. I mean, there's just occasional, that random one that shows up, but, um, I'm out chasing deer in other states and then I come back home when I'm, and then I'll just hunt, um, just perfect days. I, I don't go out when it's hot. I'm, I'm more of a hang out with the family and stuff like that. Cause I've been gone probably October, November. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. I hear that. It's uh. see, I'm sometimes the opposite where it's like, where I'll go and hunt the bad weather days only because I know, at least for me, you know, because of the amount of pressure that's around where I live and stuff that I know most people aren't going to be out, you know? And so it's like, I'll like, give me like a abnormally warm day on like a Wednesday. Like, yeah. That's like money for me. You know, I'm like, cool. I'm going to have <laughs> the woods all to myself. I'm certainly going to hunt the morning, even in October. It's like, I'll hunt the morning because that's the coolest part of the day, especially on a war- on an abnormal warm day or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of how I play it pretty often, at least, at least locally, you know, try to zig when, when other folks are, are zagging, you know, but I'm similar in the sense that if I have my, uh, if I have my way, I'll put it on that, put in that, that family time that way, <laughs> that way, when I got to go, I, I can go without any strings attached. Yeah. Right. That's, that's me. Yeah. So you're headed to, uh, you're headed to Illinois here coming up this weekend. You said, right. Mm-hmm. Nice. So what's the, uh, what's the plan plan for that? What's the, uh, you got some prospects. Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm going to, I was planning on headed up Sunday, but I'm going to head up Saturday now and just glass a couple fields Monday, really all next week. The weather's looking really good. It's 82 on Sunday, 69 on Monday. So I'm, I'm, I'm playing that front and then, whether it helps or not, there'll be a red moon all week next week. So I'm, I'm not going to stay all week, but I'll, I'll stay a few days, those first few days of that north wind yeah. and um, trying to see what I can do, capitalize on one. Yeah, you're, yeah I know, man. You're, you're killing me right now because we got a front kind of coming in too. So um, I think the uh, Saturday or, – um, our, so our season opens officially like statewide on Saturday. I live in a special regs unit, so like the area around my house opens up mid-September roughly. And then the rest of the state opens up, you know, in um, like the first weekend of October usually, like so in that time frame. So it's like either like depending on the year and how the weekends fall because we don't open except on Saturdays. Right. Um, it'll either be like the last Saturday of September or like the first Saturday of October, just depending, right? Um and, uh, so one area that I hunt, you know, it opens with the statewide. And so I've been kind of waiting and I'm watching the weather and I'm like, we just had like a bunch of rain and stuff. that's kind of been messing around. Some of it's been from that system that came through and, uh, there's going to be like a nice, like eight, nine degree temp drop between Friday and Saturday, you know, which is like perfect. So I'm going to get to hunt Saturday. 
Um, and then we don't have any Sunday hunting. So I was just, my plan was just like to scout, you know, and, and then I was actually, because I work remote, I have my trailer, my little travel trailer set up where I got Starlink in it. That way I can work from it and I can hunt mornings and evenings and stuff, you know? So I was going to kind of stay in the general area where I was planning to hunt basically most of next week, because like the weather was going to be killer and like you got the red moon and I'm looking at the weather and I'm like, Oh man, this is like, it couldn't set up any better, you know, for an opening week. Yeah. And, uh, a lot of people aren't going to be out opening week, right? Like everyone's waiting, take their time off during pre rut and rut and stuff like that. Right. And so I was like, during the week, there might be some guys around on Saturdays, like, but during the week I should have basically the run of the place. And, um, I got a work trip on Monday and Tuesday. I got to go to Chicago. Oh, man. <laughs> Dude. I'll be thinking about you. I'll text you a picture. Yeah, of a big one. yeah you, you do that. You do that. The, uh, I tried, I tried pretty hard. Like today was like, I told him the other day, I was like, ah, I can't make it. I've got a bunch of family stuff I got to do, you know? And they were like, you know, and then finally today I caved and it's like, all right. And I was like, I'll, I'll go on Monday morning, you know? So at least it's not the first weekend of, uh, November. I know. Right. Yeah. I know. That's the one thing I got to remind myself, but it's a, it's just one of those things, man, where, you know, we wait all year long, you know, every deer hunter, every guy that's listening to this knows and feels this way. Right. It's like, aside from like family obligations and like taking care of your family and stuff like that, like you just remove that, like for the purpose of like this chat, but you know, we all kind of plan and work and like try to get stuff taken care of like that way, whenever that, you know, October timeframe comes around, you know, when you get, I mean, we all know that, you know, you're always trying to line up as many things as you can in your favor, like wind might even be wind speed, depending on a deer that you're chasing. If they like a certain wind speed before they're going to move, you know, <laughs> you were trying to line up temp, you know, the best temperature we can get. If you're a guy who likes the moon phase, like you line that up, you know, if you like the red moon, like you try to line, like whatever it is, you're trying to stack all those things together just to increase your odds ever so slightly you know, to go along with the intel that you have and know what groups of deer, a buck, or just where bucks like to spend time if you're hunting a specific deer or just willing to kill anything good that comes by, right? And then when you feel like you get those conditions, you know, i.e. the first week of October this year, <laughs> you know, and then it's like you can't be there. You know, you're just like, oh. you know, because it's fickle, man. It's like you could have like, you know, years where you have, you're in the 80s during the rut or the rest of the, month is rain and just crap weather and stuff like that. And so, you know, it just, it's disheartening whenever you do all that, all that work and like you get the conditions that you want and then you, you just can't capitalize on it. Right. I mean, like you said, I, I told my wife last night, I was like, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy that it's already October and this is something like we look forward to every year. And if you don't capitalize on those little bitty cold fronts, it, it, it I don't even care if it's a day, if it's one day, and I'll drive up that morning and hunt an afternoon and just drive home, you know, for six hours. If you don't capitalize on those, there's only so many of those that you're going to get. And then it, it, we get, we're 30 days away from November. And then that's going to go by just like that. And then we're going to be wishing it was October again. Yep. So I just try to, I mean, I try to minimize my time away from my family. It might be a short three day weekend or a two day weekend or even a one day or a one day hunt, but you, you got to capitalize while they're here. Yeah. Yeah. That's just it. And that's the part that kind of truthfully drives me nuts where it's like exactly what you said. It's like, man, there's only going to be, but so many prime days within that six week window for, for Pennsylvania at least. Right. Cause archery for us runs from, you know, first week of October through like the second week of November roughly. And then we have basically a week statewide, pretty sure it's still statewide um, where there's no hunting at all before you get to Thanksgiving, I shouldn't say no hunting at all, but no deer hunting until you get to Thanksgiving. Then basically the first Saturday after the Saturday after Thanksgiving, the gun season comes in and then you can hunt with a bow if you want to still and whatever. Right. Um, but by and large at that point, like the ruts kind of dwindling down. I mean, you still get some of that late action potentially. Mm -hmm. Right. But like the, the best part of the rut, I feel like Pennsylvania, we can't hunt. It, it's that week, but that week right before Thanksgiving, you mm -hmm. know, um, which is a bummer. And so it's like for us, like, well, I look at it really, I, I got a six week sprint like to capitalize during archery season before gun, gun pressure comes in, you know, right. and the fact that I'm going to basically lose a cold front and a red moon on the first week because I got to go on a work trip drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's tough. Yeah, just, yeah. just quit your job and deer hunt forever. Dude. Don't think, don't think I ain't crossed my mind. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> told my wife, I was like, I might be, I might be getting fired here. Like, just, yeah. just so you know. <laughs> but, I'm going to fire myself. Yeah, yeah, I'll fire myself and just try to get rehired right after. How's that? Let's <laughs> see, if that see if that works out. Like, right around, like, uh, December 1st, something like that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Nice. So you got, you got some prospects in Illinois. Um, what's your game plan for that, man? Like you just mentioned, you got the front, you know, like what, is there a particular deer you're trying to kill there or. So I have two, actually one of them, he showed back up. I had pictures of him two years ago. Didn't get a single picture of him last year. He was real active those three days after Thanksgiving. And my plan mm. this whole time was, it's, it's a really good, it's a rut funnel. I mean, it's, it's a classic Bobby Worthington funnel. And, um, I plan on sitting there for those Friday, Saturday, Sunday after Thanksgiving, because him and another deer that I've had three years of history with, he was a big nine this year. He's an eight. Um, it's a deer that I call tank. He's probably 300 pounds. He's just a huge body eight pointer. He, he's probably 150 inch eight pointer. And, um, they, they've actually both, they've got to be living real close in this little corridor. It's a real thick, overgrown, probably 10 year old, uh, CRP field. And it leads into a little <clears throat> wide oak. Um, it's a, it's a little strip of woods, probably 80 yards wide. And it leads to a, like a big destination field. It's a bean field right now, but in the, in the rut, they're, they're traveling that little corridor, that 80 yard wide strip of timber staying out of the field. And uh, so I put a camera there and I always anticipate that rut movement. Mm. Well, both of them have been showing up pretty habitual mm. these these past three weeks. I mean, they're there a few times a week just passing through. I don't know if they're feeding in the oaks in that in that strip of woods and that's why they're passing through or they're still uh, the beans are still green in a certain location. It could be the sh a shaded section of that bean field. But um, so my plan right now and I've got the wind that I need next week. Um is to sit up on that, that funnel and, uh, hopefully, hopefully one of them, they're both probably, I, I think tank is, he's probably a six and a half year old. The other one may be five and a half, but they're, they're probably equivalent in score. But the other one, he's, he's got split G twos. He's got trashy, uh, brow tines. I think he's got like two or three on one side. He's just a tighter frame deer. He's not, he's not real as far as like a big frame, but, um, they're they're fairly close in size. Either one, whichever one gives me the opportunity is the one I'm on uh tight. So nice. Just... That's awesome, man. The uh <clears throat> it's uh it's funny how, you know, certain setups we identify like, you know, when we're scouting or whatever, you know, and we have these ideas of when they might be good. And we do the best we can in looking at the sign and, you know, the terrain that's around it and the bedding that might be adjacent to it or whatever the case is, and we go, you know what? This is a rut spot. Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, the deer tell you something different, right? It's, uh, it's always just kind of interesting, man. Like how you have these best laid plans, but at the end of the day, the best laid plans are really whatever the deer are telling you, you know what right. I mean? It's like, cause you probably thought in that spot, if someone would have told you when you were scouting that, that area, right. And you, and you found that setup, you know, and you're thinking of it like quintessential rut funnel, right? Like a Bobby Worthington classic. And someone said, you know what? You should hunt that the first week of October. You'd probably look at it and be like, dude, what are you talking about? <laughs> right. And, and, and the thing, the reason I say that they, it, it, it's a rut funnel because typically this time of year for the past three or four years, I, I've never had a, a shooter come through there. And it's always, it, it seems like they show up around the 19th of November, but it's a lot of, it's about a week's worth of nighttime movement. And then those three days after Thanksgiving, every single year, they're just daylight walking. It might be one o'clock in the afternoon. It might be seven in the morning, five in the afternoon. But so this year going into it, I was like, well, I know that area is going to be for my, my late season or later rut period. But if they're there now and they're walking through it, there's no sense in waiting to, to the rut to try to go find one. They might run off and get killed. That's right. I mean, that's, <clears throat> I think that. <clears throat> I've made the mistake in the past and I've kind of told myself I wouldn't do it anymore. And it sounds like, you know, you're kind of in a similar situation. And I don't know if you've done this and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you know, there was a deer two years ago that I was chasing that was really, really good for this, for this area. He was probably in the fifties, but he looked like a really young deer, like body wise. Like I looked at him and I was like, if you just covered up his antlers and you just looked at the body, like I did this with my buddy, Chad, I was like, dude, tell me that deer don't look too. 
right? Like he looks like a two year old, you know, just thin frame. Like, and he look at his antlers and I think he had 13 or 14 scorable points or something like that. And he had two G, uh, G threes on both sides that, so it wasn't like a split. It was like, he had two G threes coming off the main beam, you know, he had like double split brows, like all kinds of kickers and stuff. Like he was just a funky looking deer, you know, and he was young. And, uh, I played pussyfoot with that deer a whole for the whole season, right? Like where I knew where he was at. I had him on camera, like in, in the summer. And I had him like as a season opened and like, and because this was in an area where the season opened early, like middle of October. And I knew I had him in there feeding on acorns. They had dropped. And I was like, I know where he's at. And I didn't want to bust things. I thought I was going to bust him out there. I was like, I'm gonna have the season to hunt him. I don't want to spook him, you know? So I'm going to just nip around the edge of where he's at and see if I can't catch him coming through like a little, a pinch on his way back to bed or whatever the case Mm -hmm. is. Right. And that deer and I were ships passing in the night, the entire season. I don't know how many times I hunted an area. And I didn't know this until like after the season, whenever I pulled all my cameras and went back and looked and it was like, Oh cool. I was hunting this little saddle over here. And he came through this camera and the way to go to bed would be, he would go through this saddle and I missed him by like 30 minutes. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like it was like that the whole season. And it was after that where I was like, you know what, if there's a deer that I want to try to go after, it's like, I'm not going to be patient any longer. I'm just going to be aggressive. So I'm curious with you, do you kind of teeter on that aggressive side or do you play the more patient game when there's a deer or even two deer or whatever it is that you want to kill? A lot of times since it's out of state and like I was saying, I was trying to bide my time away from my family and stuff like that. I, I, I pretty much just get in and if he's doing something, and I see him doing it, you know, multiple times a week. I'm just going to dive in after him mm-hmm. and just hope, hope, you know, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm playing the wind and all that stuff, but I'm just hoping he's going to do that thing while I'm there. Right. Um, I, I've, I've done it in the past years ago and I just sit back and I'd wait, 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 just watch a deer from afar. And then by the time I get ready to dive in after him, well, he's already, he's already gone. He's chased the doe or he's, you know, he's off looking somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So. I just, I got, so at home, I'm, I'm the exact opposite. I'll sit back and I'll wait and I'll wait to the perfect days. And, and then I'll dive in when I, I can tiptoe around, you know, and hunt him carefully. But when it's out of state and I'm, you know, you're holding three or four other tags besides the state, I, I just try to, I try to shoot one and go to the next one. It, I mean, right. it's all about the adventure for me. So if one chase is over, I'm looking for another one. All right. Do you feel like you hunt better? at home or do you feel like you hunt better out of state? I'm more careful at home. I would say both of them, I hunt good both ways. Cause like I said, at home, I'm more, I'm more careful. I'm, I'm staying just out of the area. I'm just tiptoeing around. And, but up there I'm hunting more aggressive. Mm -hmm. It don't always work out. I mean, it's a lot of times I'm failing, but that's where you learn. Failing, mm-hmm. fail fast and fail often is what I was told. Right. Um, so I would say I'm a better hunter in the Midwest just because I'm I'm in there after him more and I'm learning more from it. Yeah. The reason that so that was <clears throat> that was kind of where I was going because that's I feel the same way where I feel like I'm actually a better hunter whenever I'm out of state because I think there's an element of. Um, paralysis that we get from thinking we know more than we do. Right. Cause I, I've had this happen to me, you know, too many times. I learned a really good lesson last year, you know, on some of the hunts I was on out of state and stuff. And, and I applied it last year to my home and, and I was successful because I was just like went into a spot and, you know, it was like, didn't have really any camera Intel, you know, that last year cause the camera had died and I just, uh, I was lazy and didn't go in and change it to be quite honest with you, you know, <laughs> and, uh, ended up killing a deer there. And it was just like, because I was going in and hunting off of what, like I felt right. And what I kind of thought, you know, there wasn't any like data really for me to like dig into per se. Right. And the same thing, whenever I was in Kansas, it was glass deer, watch him do what he's doing. He's going to do it again tomorrow. I'm going to go kill him, you know, as opposed to trying to get a bunch more information to make myself feel good. Like I know more than I do. 
right? You need one more picture of him or something. Something, you know what I mean? Like how often do we say that to ourselves, right? It's like, you know, I want to see, I want to find his rub or I want to find a track in a scrape or I want to find, like, we're always looking for a complete picture when, like, I don't think we ever get one. And I think, I honestly don't think we ever really truly understand 95% of their life, you know? I agree. And, And so that one little picture or that, one track we're waiting for isn't going to be the end all be all. Like you probably have just about what you're going to have and now just go do what you got to go do. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, the, uh, unless you're Jake Bush and then that fool follows him like all season long across like <laughs> multiple ridges and like knows when they're going to use specific trails. Like that dude's crazy. <laughs> like I don't no. know how he does it, but, but even He's part him, deer. yeah, he is part deer. Um, but even he and I have kind of talked about that to where it's like, you know, you try to study them and learn as much about their life as possible. But like, we know such a small amount about it, you know? And I think sometimes we, we pat ourselves on the back thinking we know more than we do. And then we, when we kill a deer, we're like, Oh, it's because I knew all this stuff. And it's like, "Mm, no, you probably knew enough about 90% ago. (laughs) You know what I mean? Uh, And you really didn't know all that much about him. A lot of it was just right place, right time. Like you did your homework. Right. But there's still Mm -hmm. an element of this. That's like luck. Like a coyote didn't kick him out of his bed today. A hunter didn't walk in and bust him out of like a, an acorn flat or whatever the case is. Right. Like there's a lot of things that got to go right. Yeah. And it happens. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah, exactly. I feel like it happens to me most every time I hunt, but that's just me. You know? I tell everybody I'm just the luckiest guy in the woods. <laughs> that's right, dude. That's right. Sometimes it's good to have that horseshoe in your back pocket. You know what I'm saying? That's uh, yeah. that's the that's the ticket there. So, all right. So you're headed to Illinois. Um, you got a good plan for, plan for that. Uh, and you said you're going to Kansas too, right? Uh I'm yeah, gonna so, pick your brain about this. Yeah, well, we can do we can do that off offline. We don't want to give up too many uh, secrets, but uh, <laughs> yeah, the um, the uh, on a Stoke level, man, where are you at on Stoke? Are you like one to ten? Where are you at? Uh, probably an eight, just because it's Kansas, but mm-hmm. it's also it's I wouldn't say it's new territory because I've hunted situations like this, but it, it's going to be a lot like what you was doing last year. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's on the ground, spot stalk stuff like that so i mean mm-hmm. i've done it in the past but it's um it's kind of out of my comfort zone mm-hmm. and I, I don't try to put myself i, I try to be well-rounded i don't want to be the guy that's only good at hunting rut funnels or whatever i want to be able to get it done at all times of season so it's just getting out of my comfort zone and you know trying to be better at something yeah. that i'm not good at that was a big thing for me of of doing that was you know, there's a part of me that just, I don't know, like hunting off the ground just felt more natural. I I almost like, and this might sound stupid to some people and I don't, and I don't want anyone that's listening to this to take this as though if you don't hunt, try to hunting off the ground, that you're less of a hunter or anything like that. That's not what I'm suggesting. But for me personally, I felt like as a bow hunter, part of what I need to be able to do is to hunt off the ground. You know what I mean? Like, I just felt like that was a tool that I wanted to have. And for the same reason that you kind of said, like, I like the adventure component of things and I wanted to not be held back by not going to hunt somewhere. If I have an opportunity to, you know, or to kill a deer that I'm watching because I don't feel like I I can kill him in the setup that I need to kill him in, you know, Mm -hmm. that was the biggest thing for me. And so that was one of the reasons why I started traveling a lot. Cause I was like, well, let's just go look at a bunch of different stuff. And like, I'll be forced to figure it out. Right. And then, you know, I'll get comfortable over time, over time with it. Um, what do you think, what is the thing about going out there and hunting that type of terrain is, do you think is going to be the most challenging for you? Like, what are you looking at going like, man, it's this one thing that I think is just going to be the hardest part or the most uncomfortable part for me. Um, not climbing in a tree and just yeah. it, it, sitting back and glassing one up and, and trying to find him and then putting a stock on him. Um. Yeah, just not wanting to get in a tree because I, for some reason, when I when I'm on the ground, I feel like I'm standing there with no clothes on in the middle of the mall, <laughs> like everybody's looking at me. You know, I, yeah. I I don't know. I just feel more comfortable in the stand, and that's why I want to do it. I mean, yeah. I'm trying to get outside of that. Yeah. So it's, it's, I, I'm. I'm just gonna say that feeling is <clears throat> correct. Like I felt the same way, like the first trip out there even part of the second one probably um 
Yeah, I felt pretty comfortable the second one as far as like not feeling like a sore thumb sticking out, but like you do like you. And sometimes, and as weird as this sounds, like I would be out hunting that first trip and I'd be walking somewhere through a CRP patch or like a cow pasture or whatever. And I'm, I'd be thinking to myself, like, am I really hunting? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm just walking like exactly just, just on a hike. You know what I mean? And it's, it is a little bit of a trick that like to try to flip your mindset to not just think that you're just like walking about, you know, because it's so different. Like anything could happen out there at any, at any moment, it's all kind of huntable, you know? Um, I think the biggest thing for me, whenever I first started going was like understanding how to, how to, uh, stay hidden in open territory. That was mm-hmm. the, that was like probably the hardest thing for me was kind of, and how not just to stay hidden, but how to stay hidden without going overboard was the hard part because yeah, you can find like a de- bunch of brush or something like that somewhere and kind of get encased in it. But then you also can't execute anything. You can't see right. anything. And every, yeah. And everything out there is so visual. It's like when you can't see that they can't see you, but you also can't see them. So you got to be able to right. set up in ways where it's like, you can still see, but you're kind of fooling them a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. And that was the hardest that was the hardest part was to try to gauge like how hidden am I versus how open am I, you know, um, that just comes with kind of, kind of screwing it up, playing in the shadows, trying to stick with the shadows as much as you can when you have them finding like the smallest little terrain changes, like a little ditch that might just drop like two foot or something like that, getting in that and walking, you know what I mean? That way you're not completely out in the open walking with the sun to your back with into where the deer you think are going to be that way. The sun's blinding them just like it would us if they were coming toward us and we're looking directly in the sun, like just things like that. When you set up, like just thinking about that stuff, but then things happen like that happened to me last year. Like that whole setup where I killed that deer was completely wrong. Like textbook, everything opposite of what you would like it to be. You know what I mean? But it was the only spot I knew I could kill that deer and it only had to get right for the last 15 minutes of the evening. And then when it did, like when the sun started going down, like the whole setup got right for like 15 minutes Mm -hmm. and that was all I needed. So it's a little bit of that too, is like trying to understand like how it's going to change like as the day changes. Yeah. Being able to adapt. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. That's the biggest thing out there, man. I think it's just adapting and relying on, relying on your glass, which we don't get mm-hmm. as much experience, you know, in the East or the South of relying on our glass in, in that kind of way. Right. Yeah. It's all timber country here. Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing that helped me with that was just, hunting out West some prior to that, like elk hunting and stuff like that, where it's like, you got to be on your glass pretty often, you know? And so it just made it a little Mm bit, a little bit easier, if you will. Um, so when you get that first Kansas experience of seeing like a wide open, you know, plains of like a, a big deer, just chasing, chasing a doe, like you, cause it'll happen, right. Whether or not you get close enough to kill that deer or not, but like you will have that, you know, you watch the white tail adrenaline videos guys. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, you know, that deer running across the road or whatever, like you'll get something like that. You know what I mean? Like, what do you think your reaction is going to be when you see that happen for the first time or you're just driving and there's a piece of private and you're like, holy shit, man, there's a 180 inch deer out in that, on that bean, out in that bean field or cut bean field or whatever, you know? Uh, I'll be uh, pulling up on X and finding where the <laughs> landowner lives. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. For sure, man. That's a, uh, that's the cool thing about out there, man, is, uh, is just like how, you know, the, uh, I think that was my, that's my favorite part about hunting open country. Um, is just like, you know, I'll be curious to talk to you when you get back is if you feel the same way, but like you, you feel like you're constantly and once you get over the whole idea of like, am I actually hunting? Cause I'm driving a lot and I'm glassing and then I'm walking and I'm calling and I'm getting back in my truck and I'm driving and I'm glassing. And so you're like, is this really hunting or not? Mm-hmm. Um, but then what you realize, at least I started realizing later was that I always, once I got comfortable with that, I always felt like I was in the game. Like I always felt like I was one, one turn around the next corner to seeing the deer that I'm going to go kill, you know? And like when you're in the woods, like we are a lot of times in thick timber and stuff like that, you sometimes feel like you couldn't be further from the game, you know, because I can't see further than 20 yards. And I think this is a good setup, but like that deer could be three miles from here and I'll never know. Or he could be 20 yards from me and I can't see him. It's it's that unknown because when you're sitting in a tree, like you said, it's you're hoping that he's there or hoping that you're everything's going to fall into place. But like you said, he could be three miles away, 
But at least if you can see the deer or it know that there's one there, you're in the game. And that's, that's what mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to the most. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, it's, it, it's, it's awesome and equally as unnerving because when you see them, you're like, all right, now how do I kill him? Right. Because it's like, then like, that's whenever it gets stressful because you're like, because I can see him, I feel like I should be able to kill him. Right. right. Where in the woods where we hunt in the South and in the East, there's almost a little bit of a relief because I can't see him. So how, what, how could I kill him? Right. Like you right. can't. Right. But out there, it's, you know, your mind will play tricks on you where it becomes a little bit more stressful because not every time you see them, is it the opportunity to, to kill them? You know, it's like, mm-hmm. I call I, what I, what I had learned out there was to be uh, patiently aggressive is what I called it. Like, and it wasn't until I figured that part out that I start having like really good encounters and I screwed a couple of them up where I got busted drawing and, you know, went through like the growing pains of hunting off the ground in the open country and stuff like that. But I started getting real close, on, real close to deer, you mm-hmm. know, and that was whenever I learned how to kind of be patiently aggressive and like know when to sit back and just watch what they're doing and figure out what they're going to do next. And then as soon as the opportunity to try to go in to make a kill presented, now I move, you know, mm-hmm. and, like, and then it's, then it's all in then. Right. Yeah. Wait yeah. to see what they're going to do. And then make a plan and get after it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's going to be different. I'm, I'm excited. We'll just see how it goes. Huh? Right. What's your, what's your goal for out there, man? Like what are your, what are your, what's your goals? <laughs> I know you're a workout guy. We're going to talk a little bit about that too, but I know you're a workout guy, man. So I know you got some goals. I, I don't really know. I mean, obviously it's my, my, my goal out there. And I'll have to tell you about this afterwards, but, I'm I'm gonna try to shoot something that's 150 or better. Okay, that's a good goal. That's that's 100 percent attainable. The uh, I saw a lot of. It was really weird the first year I was out there. I saw a lot of deer in like the like borderline Pope and Young, and then I saw a lot of deer that were like in. When I say a lot, I saw a handful of deer that were in like the 160 and 150, 160 and better, essentially. Um it was just really funky. They had EHD like the year prior or something like that. And, uh, like Chad and I were driving around. We we're like, it feels like that there's like a age class missing, like that one thirty to mid one forties to a 50 inch, you know, deer like felt like it just wasn't there. And that's mm-hmm. when we found out they had EHD and it basically did kind of take an age class out. So where we saw like a lot of young deer that made it through and a lot of old deer that survived, we just didn't see a lot of the deer in the middle that ended up dying, you know, um, yeah. which made sense. But yeah, man, you'll definitely, you'll definitely come across that. The other thing is too, is just, um, calling like it works. Like, don't be bashful with that. Yeah, it's something I, I do want to try. I have a, a, a heads up decoy. I actually took it to Iowa a few years ago, but I, I never got in a situation where I needed it, but I'm gonna, I'll have that. And I'll have, um, uh, some antlers and stuff like that. Nice. I took my heads up last year. Well, I took it every year I went out, but last year I actually, with the intention of using it, um, I made a little stake that I could put it on. Mm-hmm. Did yeah. So it, it so I could like it's on like a basically like a fence post. Yeah, fence post. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I got it from my buddy Travis Glassman. That's how he makes yeah. it or how he made it. Um it was his idea and I just stole it. Um and it worked great. I mean, I didn't have to decoy the deer and not kill it, but I decoyed like a a, a younger eight point into probably like five yards. That's awesome. Yeah, that thing had no clue what was happening. I got fully drawn too. Like I was off to the side of it, like totally visible. He was looked at the decoy, like was like, "What is going on with this thing?" And I got off to the side and got the full draw, like, and he, and then all of a sudden, like he was like, "Oh man, that's not a deer!" Like it took him for forever <laughs> to register. It was it was wild because I talked to Travis about it because I was like, "Dude, how much can you get away with with this?" Because I don't want to have a good deer come in and end up screwing it up because I'm moving too much. And he's like. I've had him walk right on top of me and I'm moving and I'm drawing and I'm moving the camera. He's like, it's almost like they expect to see movement around the deer. So as long as you're like off to the side of the decoy and slightly kind of like not directly behind it, but it's covering you just a little bit. He's like, you'll get away with murder. That makes sense. A lot of guys that do the, um, I've never done it, but like the reaping turkeys, how they mm-hmm. do that. Um, but the decoy fan, it's the, I think it's the same way where they're used to seeing the, you know, the turkeys blow up and, um, shoot. Um, the movement around it. So I don't right. know. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. But whenever he said it, it, it made sense to me. So I was like, before I ended up using it on a good deer that I wanted to kill, I was like, you know what? Let me use it on a smaller deer and see, 
see if it, uh, how much I can get away with. And I was, I was surprised. I hope you get to use that thing and have one just come in just freaking out on you, man. I hope so too. That's what I, that's what I'm looking forward to the most on the ground. I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll kill one if I don't need a decoy or not, just stalk in and get in range, but I'm looking forward to, to trying that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's cool how close you can get and how, how long you can, how long you can be there, like within range of them. Um, I was really surprised just how often I got just closer than to, to them more like closer than I do in Pennsylvania, even with the cover, you know, um, mm-hmm. I had a buck and a doe walk almost over top of me at one point. And I mean, they were within five yards and walked by me. I'm in a ghillie jacket and they walked by me and they went and bedded like the doe was 10 yards from me and the buck was like 15 yards from me and they bedded down for two hours. I just sat there watching what awesome. they do in a bed. You know what I mean? Like, Hey, how did they bed? He would get up and he would change positions for the like, wind would change a little bit. He would get up and move, you know, it's just what I love about hunting out in those areas, man, is you get, you get a master class on mature deer behavior. You just get yeah, to watch. Exactly. That's what, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Just being able to be in that range with them and, and see what they're doing at all times of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And especially like when you get able to sit back and glass, you know, for like a day or two and like get, get kind of like the, the beats of their life to a degree, you know what I mean? Like you can really start to piece some stuff together if you can just watch them for a little bit, you know, um, that to me was probably more valuable than anything. Um, cause I started understanding a little bit, not just the deer there, but I started understanding what deer are doing around me that I don't often get to see them do, but they're doing it. I just don't see right. it, you know? I, yeah. So this, the, at my Illinois, uh, it's a lease up there. So right when I got in it years ago, it's probably been seven or eight years ago. I would always want to sit on the wide open spaces and I would just sit back and watch them. I was never in the game really, but I was watching what they're doing and how they're, how they're moving uh, through the terrain. And you, you learn a lot by doing that. Yeah. I mean, speaking of learning a lot, I think just in general travel hunting that, you know, that I know you love to do different places. I, I love doing it, you know, wherever I can venture off to, I'll do it. Um, but that's been the biggest thing for me was just the learning kind of aspect of seeing different stuff and how it helps me, you know, hunting stuff in the open country in Kansas helps me whenever I'm hunting back home here in the mountains or hunting in the mountains. And some of the stuff I see there helps me whenever I'm in, in Kansas in different ways. I'm just, I feel like, I feel like I started, you know, leveling up whatever you want to call it, you know, to a degree with my woodsmanship and like my ability my hunting ability when I started traveling more to hunt. Like, I don't know if you feel the same way. If, like if I always tell people, it's like, you want to expedite, expedite your learning curve, try to go hunt as many places as you can. Yeah, absolutely. And number one, you're, you're putting yourself in different situations, maybe different terrain, or even if it's the same terrain, you just have more opportunities, say at the age class that you're looking for here at home. I mean, we, there may be one five and a half year old where I hunt, you know, that comes through once a year or something versus up there i may see five of those in a week Mm -hmm. so you're just being able to observe what those what that age class deer is doing in that terrain and then like you said correlate it with other terrain that you're hunting or other states or (laughs) it it, it is a master class on just and, and the more you do it the more you can piece together and you're starting to this deer this deer's personality may have the same personality as this deer and you're starting okay well it took me a while to figure out this deer. Well, now this deer, I've already got a kind of a, a jump start on. So it, it does. It, it it really helps out as far as uh, accelerating the learning curve. Yeah, especially if you're trying to hunt m- mature deer, right? Because I always say, mm-hmm. you know, there's no better teacher to, on how to hunt mature deer than trying to hunt mature deer. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Cause they just act different, you know, it's like, they're just, they're slightly different animal, you know, and they, they do things a little bit differently. Their personalities certainly play into it. Um, sometimes are, you know, they get a little bit more brazen as they get older. Some of them get Mm -hmm. a little bit more conservative when they get a little bit older, you know, it's like, yeah, it's just, it's fascinating. What do you think for you, like the travel hunting and stuff that you've done? Like, what do you think, I'm going to figure out how to say this, what part of your hunting do you think that 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 traveling has helped the most? Um, probably just jumping into it, uh, mm. like getting 
if I see something happening, don't sit there and wait, like you said, that paralysis by analysis. Don't sit there and analyze. I need one more picture of him or one more time to him to show up on this field, and I'm glassing him. Just if I see him do it once or twice, I'm I'm going after it. Just just diving into it. Don't don't mm-hmm. sit back and wait. Or if something, if you're sitting in a spot and it's not happening there, don't don't just sit there and expect for something else to happen that hadn't happened already. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if they're, they're, if you're sitting in an area and they're, and their deer are traveling 80 yards away, I'm not going to sit here and wait and, and expect one of them just to wander by me. I'm going to get down and go to where they're at. Right. Yeah. That's the biggest, that was the biggest thing for me too, was just, that was like the, mo- was the mobility part of it where mm-hmm. I don't have enough time to wait to hope that maybe they make the 80 yard transition over to where I'm at. I got to be where they're at. So I'm just going to, just going to move. And I think the other thing is too, is I think you and I talked about this, I think a little bit before we jumped on, or maybe we mentioned it when we were recording, but was, I think you said, fail, fail fast, fail often. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, I think sometimes people have a, like have an aversion to that in the area that they're familiar with and comfortable with, because they feel like, you know, I live here, I scout here a lot. I know a lot about it, so I shouldn't fail. Therefore they never put themselves in a position to fail. Right. Right. And so and you're not learning anything. Right. And so I feel like, you know, cause I used to have that too. Right. And I, and it, what solved it for me was traveling and going to places where I had no other option other t- than to fail most likely because mm-hmm. most of the tough, most of the stuff I would hunt out of state, like I would never scout before I got there. Like I would right. show up blind and I would do that purposefully cause it would force me to go just screw stuff up until I, until I figured it out, you know? And so it almost gives you a license to fail and be okay with it. Right. And you only have an X amount of days while you're there or, you know, on a trip, something like that. So yeah, you can't, you can't sit, I mean, it's different. I guess it's different when it's you, if you live in an area and you're sitting back and you're, you only have one tag and you're fine with hunting your own one state and you're just going to wait on that big one to make a mistake. But when you're traveling around the different states in order to get it done half the time, you have to, you have to get aggressive. Yeah. 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 They're not going to kill especially those, you know, higher caliber or older deer that like they're not going to kill themselves. You know, mm-hmm. they've made it that long that far by doing the things that they do. It's like, you, you have to do it on their terms. You know, like you kill young deer on yours. I feel like you kill, kill older deer on theirs. Yeah. That, one of the deer, one of the deer I'm hunting is Epstein, by the way, he ain't going to kill himself. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, dude. That's right. You might have to get some sheets out or something like that to get old boy. You might have to tie some sheets together. Turn out the lights on them, you know, turn the video cameras <laughs> off, <laughs> all that kind of stuff, man. Nice, uh, man. Well, uh, <clears throat> dude, you know, how do you, so let me ask you this, cause I know you're into working out, right? You own a gym, if I'm not mistaken, right? Correct. So one of the hard parts for me, and this might sound really stupid for people that are listening, but probably one of the biggest stressors for me during deer season, it's not even trying to kill a deer any longer. Like, cause I mean, yes, I want to kill deer, but I'm looking to have a good time and I'm going to go out and just have a blast. And if I do the right things and I get to kill a deer, you know, then awesome. But I don't, you know, live and die with the tags I fill or don't fill. Right. Right. Um, and, but the part that stress, I don't stress out too much about that. What I do stress out about though, is like getting my workouts in Mm -hmm. (laughs) as, as dumb as that might sound for people listening. Right. It's like, I stress out about, all right, so I'm going to hunt this day here. I got to travel this day here. So what days am I going to do jujitsu? All right. Okay. I got to get up early this morning. I'm not going to hunt that morning because it's going to rain. So I'm going to lift instead. Like, right. you know what I mean? Like I'm making like my plans to try to get all my work. So how do you manage to do that and run a gym at the same time and get all your hunting in? So a lot of times on out of state stuff, it's it, my gym sessions are kind of fly by the seat of my pants. If it, like you said, if it's, if it's just thunderstorms or pouring down rain, I'll go if it's morning or afternoon. Um, uh, sometimes it, it, I just, I'll skip them. I mean, mm-hmm. it's kind of one of those things I'm on vacation, not necessarily vacation. I'm there, I'm, I'm doing the work. Um, mm-hmm. but it's all right if I miss them. But as far as getting a lift in, I, if, if I'm not in the gym four to five days a week, I'm starting to get pretty cranky. <laughs> I, um, my, I just, I just need it. I don't need to leave, relieve some stress. I work a full-time job for my dad. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60 hours plus, plus run the dream, a gym. So I need, um, yeah, I need some stress relief. Yeah. I hear that. Yeah. The, uh, I was stressed out yesterday after work, went to the gym, 
felt great when I got home. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's the magical, it's the magic elixir for me. It, it's the thing that makes everything for me for makes everything work, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right. It allows me to kind of have the mental capacity, emotional capacity, physical capacity to do all the things that I, that I want to do. You right. Know? Yeah. And going to the gym, especially on the days that you don't feel like it, it it's, it's that mental building that mindset. So, mm -hmm. and, you know, those days that you're on rutcation or whatever, and you don't feel like going because you, you didn't get to bed till late or you was tracking a buddy's deer or something and you don't want to get up and go in the morning. That's that mental it's yeah. that mindset where you just got to get up and go. It's that discipline, man. You know, that's mm -hmm. what it comes down to. It's uh, you know, it's funny cause I was thinking about it while I was out elk hunting because it was, some of it was just brutal and we're hiking, you know, this elk beat me up for four days, kind of mad about it. Right. And now I've got to crawl out of this hole. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's one of those things where I'm just like, Hey, you, you got to do it. Like there is no other option. Like you just got to put your head down, put one foot in front of the other and do it. And I think so much of that too is related to, you know, you can tie it back to deer hunting, right? Cause we lose more than we win, you know, and you Absolutely. have to be willing to just kind of stay in it and put one foot in the front of the other and go out tomorrow and do it again and go scout some more and go walk some more. And, you know, and then maybe, you know, you get rewarded, right. Or, mm -hmm. or maybe you don't realize you're being rewarded while you're doing it. Right. You know? Yeah. The same way we lift and are working out. It's like, you're not going to do it for a week and get rewarded. It, it takes consistency. You know, like mm -hmm. you said, left foot, right foot. And this, the, the more you do it, the, those everything compounds. Just... Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> well that it's like, even, you know, while you're doing it, you're being rewarded. We just don't realize it. Right. Cause like if you're hunting, for example, you're out scouting, walking, you're out in nature, breathing clean air, mm -hmm. you know, uh, experiencing all the things we have to experience that we take for granted, you know? And so you're being rewarded in that moment. If you just stop and think about it. Absolutely. You know? And for me, you know, whether it's lifting or jujitsu, either way, you know, I'm being rewarded in that moment because my body is capable of doing those things. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who don't, whose bodies aren't capable to do those exactly. things. Exactly. And so I tried to start, this might be a little hippy dippy, but I started in it. I've done it for like a while, but I, I really kind of turned to it whenever I'm feeling like I don't want to go to the gym or I don't want to go train that day, you know, or, you know, it's this elk hunt and it's just beating me up and I'm like, I don't really want to get up and go again today. Right. Or it's a deer hunt and like, I'm getting beat by a deer or whatever it is. Right. When I get up, I try to say this to myself. I'm like, I get to do this today. Mm -hmm. It's not, I have to do this. It's I get to do this. You know, exactly. I get to go train. I get to go lift. <clears throat> I get to go hunt. I get to chase this deer. I get to have this beer, deer beat me. I get to have this elk beat me, you know, if you just change how you think about it, it makes a big difference. Absolutely. I agree. And there's a lot of people that would trade places with either, either one of us every day of the week. So, yeah. and I, I've got two kids and my little boys to the age now where he's like understanding things. And I'm trying to tell him, you can't take a lot of things for granted in life because you have it probably 99% better than a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So you just have to enjoy the time that you have. And Yep. That's it, man. Yeah. I try to, you know, there is, I, I said this to someone, I forget if it was at work or where it was at, but it was, I'm living someone else's dream life, you know? And when you think about it that way, you know, it makes you kind of have some gratitude, you know? I, oh yeah. You know, for sure. And I think uh, there's, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, you're good. I was just going to say, there's a lot of people that, that even wish to, to hunt their own state, let alone travel to two or three other states every year, chase bugling bulls in Idaho. Yeah, exactly, man. And so I try to remind myself of that, that like my worst days is, is the, is the day that somebody wishes for, you know, for sure. And you know, when you do that and you frame that, man, it makes it a lot easier to go, you know what? I'm having a blast, you know, mm -hmm. and even though it it's sucks bad at all, yeah, even though it sucks, you know, or, or it can suck. Right. Or you think that it does. It's like, dude, I'm still having a blast. Got a mm -hmm. smile on my face going to smile through the pain. You know what I mean? Like 
and just and just eat it you know a lot a lot of that stuff's type two fun it ain't fun in the moment but when you look back on it it's the best days ever oh yeah for sure you know like that's we don't tell the stories very often of the things that all went right mm -hmm. you know what i mean um the best stories that are told or that you hear are the or the ones that it was just a complete shit show you know and there might not even be a might not even be a shiny ending at the end you know what i mean like it could all just be terrible yeah <laughs> You know, but those are the best stories, man. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's where the, uh, that's where the fun is had. Like I still, like one of my favorite hunts of this day was with my buddy Chad in Ohio and we got our tail kicked for 10 days. And I think between the two of us, we might've seen five deer total in 10 days, something like that. And we still laugh and joke about it. It was terrible. You know, what I mean? <laughs> it was awful, but it's like, we still laugh and joke about it. And when I think of hunting with him, I don't think of like, the year in Kansas, he killed 174 inch deer. I don't think of the year that I killed mine. I think of like him and I hunting in Ohio together, getting our tails kicked in, living in his pool behind the, the Exodus pool behind trailer that they use for trade shows with no heat. Like that's what I remember. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because it was God awful, but it was great. Right. But when yeah. you get back to, to camp every night, you, you're sitting there BSing and that's, yeah, that's the good part. Yeah, that's it, man. That camp vibe. It's uh and just having a good buddy to do that with. So when you travel, do you travel solo or do you do you usually try to go with a buddy? So uh, a good buddy of mine, we actually uh, we went to Iowa together. We we both have similar setups. We we converted the back of our vehicles and we mm -hmm. sleep in those and stuff. Um it just depends on where where I go. I, so I have my lease in Illinois is um there's 12 guys in that lease and we have two houses on it. We can stay in. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it just depends on if people are there or not, but other States like Kansas this year, he has a Kansas tag too, but he's hunting a big deer in Missouri. So if he mm -hmm. doesn't kill it first, he's not going to go to Kansas until. So it, it just depends on the state. depends on the time of year, whether we're, mm -hmm. um, somewhat together or not. Right. And how important is that compatibility with a hunting buddy? As far as like, you got to find someone that who likes, who's similar to you, right? Yeah, you do. You, me and him are both obsessed about it. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, we probably talk, well, we talk daily, uh, just something about deer and, um, our wives probably hate us because we walk around with their phone on speakerphone all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you, if you're not on the kind of the same, uh, same wavelength, as far as what you're doing, it, it's, it's hard to, cause some people may not embrace that. So like, us mm -hmm. uh so you might be on a hunt it might be day two and they're already ready to go home it, it, that just it brings you down so you yeah. you've kind of bouncing energy off of each other and um uh, it, it definitely helps having somebody that's like-minded with you yeah for sure it's a good hunting buddy's worth their weight in gold man there's nothing worse than <laughs> you know being stuck in close quarters with someone that you can't wait to get away from mm -hmm. you know yeah it's uh having that ride or die is important you know, someone who's going to be willing to, you know, when they're done with their hunt and you killed one and you're waiting for them, they'll, they'll drive the hour to come across the, you know, the section to meet you, to drag your deer out, to help you drag your deer out. You know what I mean? That's, exactly. Oh yeah. That's what you need. But, uh, it's, it, um, I don't know what I was going to say, but yeah, it's good having somebody that has an, uh, another opinion. You can kind of get their opinion on it. Mm -hmm. The the situation I don't like it on my Illinois place is, you know, there's, there's 10 or 12 guys in there in the camp and they're like, well, I seen a big one over here. You need to go over here. I, I don't, I try to stay out of that situation mm -hmm. because if I go somewhere else and then I'm like, well, man, I should, if I don't see anything, I probably should have went over there. Like listen to them. I try to just stay in my own lane and, and go and do what I believe is yeah. the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, um, <clears throat> there's a good, there's a good part of like bouncing stuff off of each other. And then it becomes a little bit detrimental whenever you're, uh, if the person that you're bouncing stuff off of is, is I, I'm trying to figure out how to say it. Like, I'm like speaking, like in terms of like fact or like you need to do or whatever. Right. right? Cause Chad and I've talked about that before. Cause like, we've never talked about it. Like as far as like setting guidelines or anything like that, we just, when we talk with each other, when we get back, it's usually like, Hey, would you see, would you see like, what are you thinking of doing tomorrow? Like, Hey, and it's like, and I might be like, Hey, I'm thinking of doing this. Like, you know, I think this is what they're doing. And he might be like, hmm. Yeah. Or they might be doing this, you know, and it's, it's, and that's all it ever is. It's never, mm -hmm. Hey, you need to do, or Hey, you need to, you know, we don't, right. we don't really ever do that with each other. We just answer the questions that we ask each other essentially. Right. 
and then we leave it at that. And we don't try to change the person's opinion or mm-hmm. change what they're going to plan to do or whatever. We just let them decide. And if they want some extra Intel, like, you know, we're happy to share it with each other, but right. you know, and we've never, <clears throat> that was always just kind of like an unwritten rule with us. Like we've never talked about it. just how we've always, we've always been, you know, that's the way we are. My buddy Jay, um, when we went to Iowa, we, uh, we'd never been either one of us. And we kind of, we played paper, rock, scissors on who was going to hunt first. And, mm-hmm. um, we went to a we had scouted multiple farms that March prior, and, and he kind of picked the area he wanted to hunt. I picked where I wanted to hunt, two different farms. And when we went in to, you know, our, for our first sit, he was like, What do you, you know, what do you think about this area? And I was just like, If that's what you like, that, that's what I like. You know, I, mm-hmm. I'm not going to persuade you to say, we, we need to go over here and sit. This is your hunt. I'm here to film you. And it was the same way with him, uh, him and I. We'd go to, a, he killed, and then I went to an area that I was hunting. I was like, I picked a tree and I was like, you, what do you, you think this is a good tree? He's like, I like it. You know, as long as you like it, I like it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, man. It's uh, a, <clears throat> the other thing is too, is like how you were talking about the filming thing. When Chad and I, the first year we went to Kansas, uh, we were together and we drove a lot together and glass together. And what we would basically do is when we saw a buck to stock, like we traded off, like the first stock was his. And so I ran the decoy, he was behind with the bow, you know, and we would put a stock on and then, you know, we didn't kill that deer. We'd get in the truck. We'd find another one. Next stock, I had the bow. He had the decoy, you know, and that's how we did. We just traded off back and forth, like, you know, and just try to killing a deer there for us was, was a group effort. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like when he killed his deer, you know, I felt like I killed the deer too. You know what I mean? Like not yeah. legitimately, but like, you know, we were both there grinding it out together, trying to find where the deer were at and stuff like that. Right. I mean, of course he hunted it and he killed it and, and stuff like that, but I felt like I was a part of it with him, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was the same thing this year when I got mine, like he wasn't even in Kansas with me, but I was like, it was, it was the, the previous years in the making of doing this together that ultimately helped me do that. So he was as much a part of it. If he would have been in, been there versus not being there, you know what I mean? And that's when you Excellent. know, you got, you got good hunting buddies, you know? Oh yeah, for sure. And that's, you know, and then you have the off season phone calls of like looking at maps together. You know, we all have that group of guys that like, Hey man, let's look at a map. You know what I mean? Hey, well, let me bounce some stuff off you. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we got that, we got that group of guys that we share that intimate Intel with, you know? Yeah. We'll do that. I'll say, I'll send him a map and I'm like, pin, put, put some uh, pins on here where you would hunt and I'll see how they overlay with mine and just mm-hmm. kind of see if our brains are thinking on the same, you know, hitting on the same cylinders, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have, have a fellow deer nerds for sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice man. Well, speaking of wives getting mad at us for uh, talking on speakerphone <laughs> and stuff, we've been chopping it up here for getting up, getting close to an hour and a half, man. I'll be sensitive to your time. Make sure you got some time for the wife and kids. But uh, before I let you get going, dude, let people know where they can follow along with you and anything you want to make them aware of. Uh, Instagram, Cody Osborne underscore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I pretty much post all my, my deer content, stuff like that on there. Nice. And then um, what's the name of the gym? Uh, it's Bender's gym. Bender's gym. in what town? Mm-hmm. Scottsboro, Alabama. Scott. Hey, easy. Now you, you're finding out my details. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you'll see, you'll uh, see me posted up next to you in the woods. Hey, there he is. There, I'm just there kidding. He is. <laughs> awesome. Brother. Hey man, I appreciate you coming on, dude. Let's make sure we stay in touch. Um, and then, you know, let's talk about some Kansas and open country stuff, man. I, I wish you nothing but the best success, not just this entire season, but Kansas, especially just cause it has a, it's near and dear to my heart. I like when to see when people go out and enjoy that kind of open country and get to enjoy what it, it has to offer. And I hope you get the full experience, man. I sure do appreciate it. I hope you uh, do great things. Uh, I know you will. So I right. appreciate it. Appreciate it, man. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. And hell, while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there too. And before I shut this thing down, we need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Osseo Gear, Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, and Genesee Beer. And until next time, we'll see y'all.